Good morning. This is a very difficult morning. And I would like to address uh, the situation that we're in. <clears throat> we are in the Gospel of Luke, and I am titling today's message, Mary and her Antitype, the Queen of Heaven. We heard the reading from Jeremiah 44. And I guess I'll just go back to the cover slide for a minute. Um, I have somewhat to say to you. And I, it's, it's part of my life testimony since I was saved. <clears throat> and I want to give a very clear sound of the trumpet, as it were, and not, and not mess around with any kind of confusion that may be a part of our culture or otherwise. Thing that I would like to begin with in terms of perspective is um, when Paul commanded us to pray in Timothy, what did he say? And I command that men everywhere lift up holy hands unto God and to pray for kings and governors and rulers that we might live a peaceable and a quiet life so that the Word of God might go forth from us in an evangelical way and bring others to Him. I believe that it has long, well, let me just state this in terms of um, who, who I am in terms of as a Christian. Um, I was taught growing up that we're a Christian nation. I got born again and discovered we're not a Christian nation. And we're not a Christian nation. We've never been a Christian nation. It's not possible for us to be a Christian nation because there's no such thing as a Christian nation until Jesus comes and reigns. However, God has been gracious to our country in that the influence of Christianity has been enormous in the founding of our laws and establishing the principles and their those type of things that we've enjoyed and long and long have enjoyed. <clears throat> we read from Jeremiah 44 and we read about a group of people who were rebels. Just to give a little bit of backdrop, their rebellion centered around the fact that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit, by God through the prophet Jeremiah, they were forbidden to go to Egypt to escape Nebuchadnezzar's coming army. They were trying to save their hide, literally, as it were, and they were running for their life. Not only were they running for their life to save their hide, this prophecy from chapter 44 apparently was, was delivered to them while they were in Egypt. And as it was delivered to them while they were in Egypt, it was pointed out to them their sin that they had in Jerusalem, that they deliberately were choosing to continue in Egypt and God's judgment on them. <clears throat> I, I, I trust that you can look this up later and do some study on your own as a family. Jeremiah 29 is a very important offsetting passage. <clears throat> it's a passage of, it's a prophecy to another group of people who are no longer in Jerusalem. They're in Babylon. They've been carted off as slaves by King Nebuchadnezzar. They're the ones who are the obedient ones because they bent the knee, as it were, and submitted themselves to Nebuchadnezzar. You would have to read the history of Jeremiah just a little bit more 
to get the full flow, but basically there were three groups of people. The people that came out voluntarily to surrender themselves as slaves to Nebuchadnezzar, they went down to Babylon. There was also a group of people who went to Egypt to save their neck, and there were the stubborn, arrogant ones that stayed and were butchered. <clears throat> but the butchering of the children of Israel and the destruction of Jerusalem is the most significant historical marker in terms of the promises of God and the work of God. It ended what we might have called a Christian nation, just as it, in the context of Judeo-Christian values, it was really a Jewish nation, but it was a theocracy. Now children, a theocracy is different from a democracy. And so for Christians ever to say that a democracy is a Christian nation, they're fools because you cannot be a Christian nation unless you're a theocracy. <coughs> Meaning that the laws of heaven are governing the laws of earth. That day's coming, the theocracy is coming, and those who know the Lord, Scripture says, will be part of the government in that thousand year millennium. So, with that in mind, with, with that counterbalance in mind, <clears throat> I'm going to refer back to Jeremiah 29, and you can study it later. But essentially what's said in Jeremiah 29 is this. I have judged your nation. And under that judgment, I want you to submit to those I have placed you under in terms of their authority. And he says to them, build houses, plant gardens, plant vineyards, have families, get married, have kids. Because by being obedient under the submission of God's judgment, you express your faith in the God who has ordered that judgment for you. Now if you've not studied the book of Daniel, or if you've not studied it for a long time and don't remember, the book of Daniel is a very unique book. In my early Christian life I had never read it as before I was saved. In my early Christian life I was um, astonished, or to use King James words, astonished. I was astonished at the book of Daniel because the book of Daniel had, has a very substantive theme that is so applicable to us today. The substantive thing of the book of Daniel, is, of Daniel is this. God has ended his theocracy on the earth under the Jew, the Jewish race, the Jewish nation. He's ended that. And he has declared that that will not be taken up again until Christ returns, the victor, to rule and reign. If you, if you remember your Bible at all in the New Testament, you'll remember that the Jews, when Christ came, they had a misunderstanding of his coming. They were expecting Christ to come, and in the coming, that he was going to establish his kingdom once again on the earth. It was such a substantial, core value of Jewish tradition from their understanding of the Old Testament that the disciples were so confused when Jesus said, I'm going to die. And they, and they protested, no, no, not so. It's kingdom, kingdom, remember kingdom, remember that? So he died and then there was that relief that came by resurrection. And there's the Jews, excuse me, there's the disciples, Jews, who are standing on the mount as Jesus is getting ready to be raised back into heaven. And, and they say, okay, okay, now, now you're going to do it? Now you're going to accept the kingdom up? Now? And he said, no. It's not given for you to know the times and the season when that kingdom will be established. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you shall be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. 
We are under that mandate at this very hour. The founding of America was based on persecution of Christians who were seeking to obey and to serve the Lord. The founding of America is not the establishment of a Christian nation. Regardless of what proclamation was made, what documents were written, America was never a Christian nation because it's not possible to be a Christian nation without Jesus sitting directly on the throne and his righteousness being perfectly instituted. And so we need to understand who we are and what we are and where we are in the midst of what that is. For us, we have great relief that the New Testament was written while the pagan Roman government was reigning over the earth. Because there's no mistake at the time the church was started that, that somehow the church was a part of the state and that somehow that the church was governing and ruling over the state though that misperception and thus corruption of truth occurred 400 years later and has been fomented on the world for a very long time. <clears throat> but it's imperative that we understand where we are and what our role is. So <clears throat> we're called to live as pilgrims, Hebrews chapter 11. We're not called to live as citizens of this world or citizens of this nation. We're called to live as pilgrims, as sojourners, those who are passing through, waiting for the kingdom. We're looking for that kingdom whose builder and maker is God. That's our testimony. That, that's New Testament theology. That's the New Testament theology of what it means to walk and live by faith. Therefore, when we find ourselves in the land, what was, what was told the Jews in Jeremiah 29 was, you need to pray for that government wheresoever you find yourself. That God would bless that government so that you might be blessed under that general blessing. America has been long blessed in a significant, substantial way. The blessing has been so significant, President Theodore Roosevelt said that uh, we're such a Christian nation that we don't even go around asking each other, do you know the Lord? Because essentially the whole culture is Christian and everybody knows the Lord. He wasn't meaning absolutely, but he was just meaning largely. That was at the turn of the last century when he was president. <clears throat> now, I'm assuming you all know that Friday the Supreme Court ruled on, on a legal matter defining marriage in our country. <clears throat> and that definition has brought to the very foreground, the very forefront um, of our Christian walk in this culture. It's brought a, up a brand new battle line. The battle line was presented and argued in the case that basically there would be a coercion of Christians who did not agree with the decision. There would be a coercion of them to comply or lose social status. So that being a clear argument for the decision to come down as it has is a clear bell, bell matter or whatever bellwether, that time has come. <clears throat> so I think it's important that we understand the Bible accurately if we're going to walk today in this, in this nation that we perhaps have always assumed and imagined as a Christian nation and we've assumed our, our, our Christian civil liberties would be protected and preserved. <clears throat> but we're at that place now where that's that is not the structural case of law, and we are now in an adversarial position to believe and to behave according to our beliefs, according to the Word of God. 
So, as we, uh, the, the, the segue, the first line on the text here from Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God. Do you know the last time the angel Gabriel was sent from God? Recorded in scripture? I said, oh brother. <laughs> Do you know the time before that? I mean, you're exactly right. We just, we just talked about him appearing to Zacharias. Okay, the time before that. I'm calling this as one time, but I realize there's five, six months apart. When was the last time prior to Zacharias? Daniel 9. Now, there's, there's other angel visitations in Daniel, and not so sure that one of them is Michael the Archangel, but I'm not so sure that because an angel is unnamed that we can just assume that it's Gabriel or Michael the Archangel. is not not really certain. But Daniel 9 is a significant chapter in terms of the scripture. When we, when, when we look at this account here, I, I, I love it when you can take Old Testament, New Testament, and link them together inseparably by some incredible fact. And in Daniel 9, the angel Gabriel visits Daniel, and he gives him the chronology of the Jewish history. Daniel's in Babylon, a captive, a slave, under the governance of King Nebuchadnezzar, and while there, as he's praying, he prays this incredible prayer of repentance. And by the way, um, may I suggest to you as a family, use Daniel 9, Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. Use it as a template for prayer as a family, for God's people. We may not be a Christian nation, but we've had many, many, many Christians that have been deeply a part of our culture. And God deals with his people. And when he says that judgment must first begin at the house of God, he's talking about Christians, believers. He's, that group of people exist. And they're exclusively separate from those who are not God's people. The rest, the residual. But as he, as he comes in Daniel 9 and, and speaks, what he says is 70 weeks are decreed upon your people. It's a prophetic utterance. Now, in terms of Hebrew poetry and application, it's clear from the context that the 70 weeks were 70 sevens, okay, which is 490 year history, it was decreed. <clears throat> and the decree begins this way, and this is why I'm trying to explain in, in no uncertain terms the order of God's purposes on the earth. It says, from the destruction of Jerusalem, from the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, from that day until the Messiah would come, it would be 69 weeks. Those who've done the math and calculated, Angel Gabriel arriving here is at the 69th week. 400 and <clears throat> however many is <laughs> 43 years something like that or 40, 42 years have expired and that's a historical fact uncontested and then it said there's one week left so during that one week that's left we have this basic Summary. It's not my intention to get into the full-fledged understanding of all the aspects of prophecy, but there was going to be the cutting off of the Messiah. 
And then there was going to be, in the middle of the week, the setting up of the abomination of desolation in the temple. <clears throat> and then there was going to be the end. So those who've understood and looked at prophecy, we've, you know, it, it's puzzled us because between the 69th week and the 70th week, so far it's been 2,000 years. Now I realize there are some people that teach otherwise, and it's not my intention to get into that. <clears throat> because the hour that we're in is in, it's imperative that we understand what the scope and sequence is for God's people. <clears throat> so as we, as we reckon with this understanding, it's important that we understand that our role in America is the same role that the Christians had when Jesus first left this earth under the Roman domination. And our relationship to the government is the same. Jesus is not going to come and be elected president of the United States. Okay, our, our country is not the New Jerusalem, which has been falsely taught since its inception. So, <clears throat> there's an imperativeness to our attitude and towards our view because we have to ask the question, what is our lot and what is our role? From the prophecy of Jeremiah and from the command of Paul in 1 Timothy, our first responsibility is to pray for the land that we're in. We're to pray for a peaceable and a quiet life. But we also need to recognize that as we're in this particular land, that we may indeed face persecution beyond our control. And the question for us, frankly, is will we stand or will we buckle under the duress? Now, if you look at Revelation chapter 12 and 13, and you get into this place that's called the middle of the week, Satan comes down, sets up a government, sets up an abomination of desolation, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. When this government occurs, um, an edict is issued, basically, an economic edict that basically says, <clears throat> unless you yield, unless you give allegiance to Satan and his throne, then you're going to have no right, no, no privilege, as it were, to conduct financial affairs. So what that represents is the fact that um, money, being able to feed your family, is going to be the core 